Thank you, Shuo. And our last speaker today is Harriet Bokali, who is a professor of geography at Durham University. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne, and also thank you to the organisers for inviting me to speak today. Um, I hope I'm going to live up to the billing of being the academic on the panel, but I think both of our previous speakers have also been um, fairly, uh, uh, well, at least parts of their, their talks have been on the academic side as well. We'll see where we go. What I wanted to do, really, was to think about as work on cities and climate change is becoming in itself mainstreamed, what can we reflect on about urban governance and climate change? And I really want to ask perhaps a slightly difficult question, um, certainly one for me, it's quite difficult as I've been working on urban governance and climate change for the last decade, about whether we're missing the point. And I'm going to say a little bit about what I mean by that. So first of all, I think we need to understand what the point of urban climate governance might be. And then I want to tell a few tales, if you like, a few tales on governance. It's probably not, uh, yeah, perhaps not a particularly nice thing for us to hear sometimes, but I think we need to tell ourselves what's going on in the field. That set of stories is going to take me to look for urban climate governance in a few unlikely places. Um, and then I want to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we're doing at Durham University on urban climate experiments, which resonates very much with some of the discussion that the two other speakers have raised about the nature of innovation and responses to climate change. Um, and I hope by the end of it I'm going to come back to the point of urban climate <coughs> governance. So I do promise to Patty, if she's in the room, that I did write this before she started saying it's the economy stupid yesterday. But it, um, I think, you know, in the, the audience that I'm in today, it hardly needs any kind of justification for why we're looking at cities and climate change. Uh, much in the same way that the Clinton campaign in 1992 pointed to the central importance of the economy stupid, it, it is the city stupid, as far as we're concerned, that's important in relation to climate change are reflecting what we might call this urban climate reality. Since the early 1990s, various cities have individually and collectively in sought to engage with climate change in various different ways. We've seen cities as critical sites for mitigation and adaptation. And this effort has gathered significant pace, particularly in the last five years. But, and there is always a but with a social science academic, so I'm living up to that so far. Uh, but... Um, I think this self-evident truth of both a pressing need for climate governance and its reality in the city is perhaps meant that we haven't asked ourselves enough questions about what urban climate governance is and what it can do. Um, and I want to start with a few uh, pointers to the, the fact that we need to look at this more closely by raising the question of the fact that not everything in the climate change urban garden is smelling of roses. The first thing is that our evaluations of what is actually happening as a result of urban climate governance are few and far between. Um, we have some assessments of what large-scale urban programs to address climate change have achieved, and the figures are impressive to one extent or another. You can see something like Ickley's work in Australia on climate change mitigation. They suggest that collectively cities in Australia over the last decade have reduced emissions by 18 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent, saving some $95 million, uh, Australian dollars that is, for um, councils. But put aside that to a figure of 542 million tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent as the annual output of greenhouse gases in Australia, you see that ICLEI's programme saved, roughly speaking, 3% of an annual, over 10 years, 3% of an annual emissions from Australia. So at this programme scale, achievements are being made, but they possibly pale in, uh, in significance in relation to the problem that we face. At a project scale, I think we see more evidence that success is happening. You see various different projects where emissions have been reduced by 25, 30, 45%, um, savings, financial, and other sorts of indirect benefits being realised. Um, but I think we also have to ask ourselves a few questions about the rhetoric that we put on co-benefits. We see a lot about co-benefits as a means of framing climate change, of moving the urban climate governance agenda forward. But to whom are those co-benefits occurring? Um, What's the sort of, uh, what does that actually mean for people who are living in cities? Are those kind of co-benefits, financial savings, improved health, air quality and so on, livability we often talk about, actually being realised by those who need it the most? So I think in this context of both a persistent need for urban climate governance, a sense that it is a reality that we, we are currently living with as well, and this idea that 
things aren't moving as fast as we might want them to, it's little wonder then that there is a persistent sense of a gap between rhetoric and reality, of a gap between policies not implemented, targets not fulfilled, and most of our urban world unaltered by a concern to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or to adapt to the impact of climate change. What I think is particularly interesting about this sense of a persistence gap is that it's governance that is seen to be able to fill this gap. Often we call upon urban governance as a means to overcome this gap between act and action, oh, between our intentions and our actions. But is this the case? Can governance actually fill this gap between the need to act and action itself? And if so, what kind of governance is it and where can we get some more of it? Okay, so I think there are three ways in which we can kind of take the tale of urban climate change governance. I'll try and do this reasonably briefly. Um, let's see how that goes. The first, I think, is the uh, approach which is probably most familiar to this audience, audience, and I certainly think it's the discourse that dominates the global environmental change community, is the idea that what we need is more good stuff. We need more knowledge, institutional coordination, policy integration, resources, par participation, partnership, and so on. And certainly, uh, this, is a, this is a line that I have myself taken, a report that I wrote with uh, Heike Schroeder and other colleagues from Environmental Change Institute 2009 for the World Bank, um, looked at what the capacity issues were in eight cities in industrialising countries and found very broadly similar um, capacity challenges in those cities as as the research literature had suggested in cities in America, Canada, Australia and Europe over the previous decade, and of, of the kind of issues that I've put on the slide. So there isn't anything inherently wrong with this approach, of course not, if I've been doing it, but um, I think it does reveal only part of the urban governance problem, and perhaps here I'm going to be slightly controversial, that it potentially misdirects our attention as to where efforts to govern climate change should be placed. And this is for three key reasons. The first is that I'm not sure that there is a correspondence between capacity to act and action itself. There are lots of cities in the world where there is a significant capacity to act on climate change and it's not happening. We could, I could elaborate on that point, but I won't right now. The second is that such accounts of the need for better and more urban governance often don't take into account of what we might call actually existing governance, the governance that is happening absolutely every day and to which these two papers that we've just heard have very um, eruditely shown us what governing climate change in cities actually means and the complexities of that. But the third and perhaps more foundational point is that this is a model of urban governance that assumes that order can be brought to the city and in fact that that would be a good thing. I'm not sure that that is the case from our uh, experience of the urban. Cities are unruly, often chaotic and dangerous, but they are also generous and generative. And I think we miss that idea of what the city is when we seek to order it and manage it in this way. My second tale on climate governance is a different kind of tale, a tale, if you like, of actually existing urban governance, which looks at the political economy of, of, of climate governance in the city, and which seeks to talk to us about what it is about urban political and economic interests which is preventing climate governance taking place. So if you like, this is slightly closer to the everyday experience of cities. It's an old tale of conflict between interests. But there are some new versions of this tale being told. We heard some of these. Um, in our sessions yesterday on urban climate governance, of making new carbon economies, of bringing together ideas of growth and climate change, and of the emergence of uh, what um, some geographers in the UK have called a coming era of carbon control, which they suggest may alter the strategic context for acting in the city. So here, the idea of addressing climate change in the city and of changing urban governance would not be about improving institutional um, capacity as such, but it would be about, if you like, meeting the people where they are, as James Lopez pointed out yesterday. It would be about uh, seeking to involve private and public interests towards the carbon uh, economy. It's much easier to make a case for meeting those interests where there's money and carbon to be made, and possibly much less easy to make that around issues of adaptation. And it's also the case that in a politics of climate change like this, where money, uh, for those who, for whom money doesn't talk, they may not get heard. So is this the kind of governance that we need? Do we need to think about urban climate governance in this more um, real politic kind of sense? 
uh, again, a yes but answer. And it's a fairly big but. It's a, bit, uh, it's a but about how governance actually might be conceived differently and also of what cities are actually made from. So my third tale of urban governance is one that takes, as its departure point, a very different understanding of power and capacity from those previous two tales. If you like, what united the other two tales of climate governance was about governance as something which is achieved by actors and institutions and held over other people. Governance is derived from the authority that actors and institutions have over others. A very different account of power, however, exists out there in the social sciences, which suggests that power is not something that people wield over one another, but that it's something that is generated through the actions of us together, if you like. Um, this model of power is generative, suggests that, power, that governance is a process, if you like. It's not a capacity, it's not an institution, but it takes place in process. And Tanya Marie-Lee, an anthropologist based in Canada, suggests that governance is a process underpinned by what she terms the will to improve. This idea that we attempt to direct all sorts of ideas of conduct towards desired outcomes and avert others. It operates not through um, conventional sorts of institutions as organisations, but rather through discourses, ideas, rationalities, through which what is to be governed becomes known, but also technologies, the very sort of mundane, everyday practices of making climate governance real. So in this sense, a scientific report of what emissions in a particular city like London might look like would be part of the process of governing that city itself. It wouldn't be outside of the process of governing. It would be making what it means to govern London in a climate change way. It would be permitting that to take place. So this kind of governance is not something that actors do on their own. It's something that actors can only do in collaboration with objects, with the material world. And it's that point that I'm going to come back to in a little bit. So these three different tales of climate governance, if you like, tell us something very different about where we might find climate governance in the city. Now, some of you may be uh, familiar with the character Wally, or Waldo, as I believe he's known in some parts of the world. Um, but... <laughs> What I think this suggests to us is that we need to look for climate governance in some very different places. So if Wally was looking for climate governance, I think he would not just be looking in the Greater London Authority, which is the picture on my right. Um, he wouldn't also be looking for it in the headquarters of the cooperative uh, organisation. One of the in, this is the cooperative tower in Manchester, in northwest England, the largest solar array. Um, in that country. But he would also start to be looking for it in the water works, in the sewage treatment pipes, in new urban developments, in energy retrofitting projects, in light bulbs, and in other sorts of more mundane places. But that is the stuff of what cities are made. And I think we ignore it at our peril. In fact, it seems to me strikingly uh, neglectful of us, actually, to have relatively ignored all of the materials and artefacts that make the city what it is when we're thinking about the way in which governance takes place. For most of us, the electricity wires, the buildings that we inhabit and so on are either a convenient backdrop of the city upon which climate governance takes place, a sort of stage, if you like, or else they are waiting idly by, ready to be called on at any minute's notice to be put to our will to address climate change. But I think another very interesting point uh, that was made yesterday about how King County had actually managed to make climate governance work was that they had to act when the pipes were open. So the city's networks, its infrastructure networks itself made governance possible and I think some of the cases of innovation and experimentation that we've been talking about earlier today also suggest that if we don't pay attention to how the materiality of our cities structures what is and isn't possible in governance terms, we will miss a great deal. So to this end, uh, a project that I'm running at the moment at Durham University, Vanessa is working with me is in the audience and we have a group of other students working as well, um, is, is called Urban Transitions. And in this project what we're seeking to look at is we're terming urban climate change experiments, project-based interventions in the city which seek to address climate change. 
we have, I could talk a very great deal about this, and I'm going to try and be as brief as I can, and methodologically I'm going to not discuss what we've done, apart from to say that we've looked at 100 cities around the world, and we have looked at 100 global cities. Um, a lot of talk has been made of ordinary cities and small cities and so on and so forth, and I agree, but in a mitigation sense, the largest cities at the moment are the ones pumping out a lot of emissions into the atmosphere and we need to look at what they're doing and not all of those large cities are kind of popular and nice places that people like to go to all the time um, there are some fairly interesting examples in our sample including uh, Tehran, Monterey some other reasonably dangerous places too um, so anyway 100 cities and we've looked at experiments, thank you, um, in these 100 cities and we found roughly speaking about 550 <coughs> Uh, experiments in the mitigation side and about 75 experiments on the adaptation side. Um, this data is just about the mitigation experiments and it shows you a rough distribution of where we're finding those experiments compared to the database cities. They predominate in, uh, you know, the Europe and North America have slightly more experiments than the number of cities included in the sample, but not significantly. And for us this is an important uh, finding because it suggests that urban climate change experiments are happening in cities across the world. So that this is becoming part of the way in which cities are developing. We looked at what sorts of actors are involved in different urban climate exchange experiments and we see a predominant role for municipal actors. Uh, for local government. In, we include in our local government categorization here um, state-based and state-owned or state-related uh, energy companies and waste companies and so on. So it's not only municipal governments that we count as part of the local governance here. But importantly also a strong role for private sector actors, particularly in the Asian region. So we're seeing a different, a different geography, if you like, of urban climate change experiments across different regions, depending on what sorts of actors are involved. And then just the third slide that I've pulled out of a vast range of data that we have on these projects at the moment is a question of how far issues of inclusion and of socio and economic justice outcomes are being considered by the projects that we look at. And this is a percentage figure of of the projects started by, initiated by a particular actor, what proportion of them are dealing with <laughs> issues of environmental justice or environment and social justice. And uh, Perhaps unsurprisingly, community-based organisations have a high level of um, concern for justice issues. But there's still 45% of projects that are started by community-based organisations that don't have an explicit justice rationale. Um, but importantly for us, uh, municipal governments who are at the heart of this kind of experimentation um, boom, if you like, uh, have a very low priority on issues of social and environmental justice. So that, I think, is just a flavour of what might be happening in climate change governance if we were to look beyond the plan, beyond what lo local city governments are doing in and of themselves at that sort of citywide scale, and to look for different sites of climate governance in the city and to think about what it might mean to innovate, what it might mean to experiment with climate change governance in the city, and how, in some more detailed case study work, we're looking at what the impacts of those experiments have been in the city and what that means for how they changing broader urban uh, development goals around climate change. So if I was to get back to the point at the beginning of my talk, what is it about urban governance, what is it about cities and climate change and urban governance that matters? Well, climate change, again, it's not an issue that I have to raise with you, but still it is an issue that I have to raise with several different audiences, is a pressing urban problem. We've sought to govern climate change through good governance Doing this alone, I don't think, is going to help us get that far. That we need to attend to the politics of who wins, who loses, and how we can make this more just. But equally, we need to attend to what we might term the social and material networks, the infrastructures, which, again, I don't want to say that I'm just looking at a pipe on its own, but the way in which the social and the technical come together to make certain forms of water, energy, waste provision possible in cities and how we can intervene. Um, one way I think that cities are already doing this is by making space for experiments and we could do well I think to adopt a more experimental approach to our own understanding of urban climate change governance drawing across different bodies of theoretical work different methodological approaches and looking uh, I think in the city in a different way for where urban climate governance is taking place. Thank you.